I'm president of the League of Women Voters of Kent County. This event is co-sponsored by the Kent, Queen Anne's, and Midshore Leagues of Women Voters, and Kent is pleased to serve as the lead league in this election cycle. I'm going to put, take a little time to put a plug in for the league. The league has played a vital role in the voter education and advocacy since its inception 96 years ago, shortly after the enactment of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution giving women the right to vote. You probably know us best for candidate forms like this one and for the voter's guide, which we have again and is, uh, will be uh, inserted into your local papers if it hasn't been already, and there are some extra copies out in the lobby and also at your libraries. The guide is the pri it, for the prime. Uh, our, our league wishes to thank the Star Democrat Publishing for sharing the cost of producing the guides. The league's activities are completely nonpartisan, but we also advocate for other issues important for our community, such as transportation, health care, and the environment. Members, both men and women and men, from all parts of the political spectrum are needed to help to keep the league vibrant. All of our activities are managed through donations and members' dues. We welcome your membership and your support, and we hope you consider joining the League. There is membership information out also out in the lobby. This afternoon, we're very fortunate to have Alice Ritchie as our moderator. Ms. Ritchie is a member of the Kent League and is a retired attorney from Chestertown. I would like to welcome Ms. Ritchie as our moderator. Thank you very much. I'd invite the candidates to come onto the stage. They're, they're going to be seated at uh, the tables in the order that um, was determined by drawing straws before we began the program. Here directly to my left is Mr. Sh Michael Schmiegel. Thank you. if we don't have any applause to to the end except for a, a small exception for another gentleman who's here today um, and then Mr. Harris is uh, welcome Mr. Harris and Mr. Um, Jackson Andrew Jackson Sean Jackson <laughs> <laughs> and uh, last but not least Jonathan Goff at the end um, before I explain the format this afternoon. I just want to make a brief announcement. Unfortunately for all of you who have come here in, uh, in order to see all the candidates that are available for, on uh, the primary ballot on both parties, uh, one of the Democratic candidates, Mr. Werner, has failed to appear. We can't really explain or give a uh, an explanation for his absence because earlier he had promised to be here. But consistent with the league's stack, tax status and under federal election laws, we may not host a federal candidate's appearance that is campaign related when there is only one of the can candidates here. Therefore, um, we are not able to have the opportunity of hearing from Mr. Ariton today. He is one of the Democratic candidates. He will uh, be here and he has agreed to stay and accept uh, some questions at the end of the program. And I'm going to ask him to stand up and uh, if you could give him a hand of applause. <laughs> he, has been, he has been very gracious in accepting this ruling. Okay, the format this afternoon is as follows. We have four Republican candidates for the seat in the House of Representatives, and they are right here. In, order, in an order that was determined by drawing straws just prior to the start of the program, we will begin the forum with opening remarks by each candidate, and they will have two minutes. Then I will put to each candidate in order three questions prepared by the League, and they are in uh, your program, which I hope you all got. Um, they have two minutes for each answer. And the timers are seated right here in the front, and they will be alerting 
the candidates when uh, the time is almost up and then when it is truly up. Your, when the three questions and their answers are complete, we will open the forum to questions from the floor. Your questions must be written on cards which you have been provided. Everybody have a card? Or if they don't, maybe they've already put their question on it. You will give those to runners who are positioned around uh, our little um, auditorium here. And they will take the questions to the screeners, and the screeners will pass the questions to me. Again, the answers to these questions will be kept to two minutes. And by 3.45, we will have finished the question period so that each candidate will have an opportunity to give their closing statements. As you can see, time is of the essence, and please refrain from applause during the forum. We will have a ample opportunity at the end to give the candidates a rousing round of applause. And now, let's start with the opening statements. Mr. Schmeagel. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the League of Women Voters for having this forum. My name is Michael Smeagle. For those of you who do not know me, um, I was born and raised here in Maryland. My mother well, was handicapped, a single mother who raised four children. I was the oldest of four children. I learned very early on the value of a dollar uh, going out to the store, carrying groceries or selling newspapers or shining shoes. And you bring home milk, bread, and eggs. You had uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And so when I was old enough, I uh, joined the Marine Corps at 16 years old. Um, was able to, uh, got out in 1979 and went to uh, community college where I studied uh, psychology and uh, history and went to a four-year school after uh, that and then went to law school. During law school I worked midnight to eights in a uh, mental institution. I was a man in a white coat and I worked in a respite care center so I've had extensive history in working and my whole life I've worked at least two jobs both uh, in school and in the service. So when I got out now 12 years ago, um, I was elected to the Maryland House of Delegates. I spent 12 years there. Uh, I was the vice chair of the Eastern Shore Delegation. Um, I was on the Judiciary Committee, and I was also the minority parliamentarian for the Maryland House of Delegates to make sure that the rules were followed, and so I'll be sure to stop when my two minutes comes. <laughs> but um, as a uh, delegate and in the Maryland House, I worked very hard to make sure that the principles that I hold from this Constitution were always upheld over party or politics. And that's what I promised to do in Congress, and it's important that when somebody tells you that they will do something, they uphold their word, and they actually do it when they go there. Too many people say all the right things, they do all the wrong things, and I promise you I will do as I did in the Maryland House of Delegates and always uphold the principles of the Constitution. Thank you. Mr. Harris. Thank you very much, and I also want to thank the League of Women Voters for doing this. Uh, you know, as many of you know, my parents came from communist countries. You can't, can't have this kind of forum in a communist country. I had the opportunity to visit China. Those of you who follow China policy right now know that President Xi over there is having a crackdown on his opponents. You can't do this over there, but you can do it here in America. Great country, best country in the world, glad to be here. It's been a privilege over five years to represent the 1st Congressional District. In that time, I've cast over 3,600 votes on behalf of the people in the 1st Congressional District. And I'm sure my voting record will be discussed today. Uh, I'm sure if Mr. Ireton were on the stage, it would be discussed even more, and it, and it may, may be discussed if, if I uh, have the privilege of winning the primary and representing the Republican Party. Uh, and again, that kind of discussion can only happen in a country like this, so I welcome that. You know, as a physician, uh, I know the importance, and I, as many of you know, I practice part-time at Memorial Hospital right down the road. Uh, I know the importance of delivering health care. I know the difficulty in keeping it affordable and making sure everyone has access, but I'll tell you, the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare is not the way to get it done. If you didn't get a subsidy or you weren't on Medicaid, it was expensive, and we'll talk more about that, I'm sure, during the debate. As a veteran, I was in the Naval Reserve Medical Corps. Uh, I know I was recalled during Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm, the first Gulf War. Unfortunately, we have to give it a number, the first Gulf War. Uh, I suspect it's the first of several actions we're going to be taking in the area. And around the world, our military uh, posture is weak. 
we are perceived as weak around the world, and it is dangerous. In a dangerous world, that's, that's not the way to do it. Finally, as a father and grandfather, and uh, if I look a little tired, 1156, my daughter gave birth. I was there uh, yesterday, uh, yesterday evening. Uh, my grandson was born with $50,000 federal debt. $50,000 was his share at birth. We've got to deal with that. We've got to deal with the uh, debt and the deficit. We've got to pay down that debt. And thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Jackson. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you, everybody, for coming out. Uh, my name is Sean Jackson. Uh, the reason I'm running is that pretty much I think people are getting tired of what's happening with the status quo and politicians and being lied to. Um, you get tired of it, and that's why I'm running. I I'm just like every single one of you. I'm just a hardworking person who's said that I've had enough, and now I'm going to go into the political uh, realm and, and put forth a voice that I think is not uh, being spoken for uh, in D.C. Uh, I grew up in Connecticut and Massachusetts. I left for the Marine Corps in 1988. I served six years in the Marine Corps. And upon leaving the Marine Corps, I joined the Maryland State Police, where I've been with them for 20, almost 20 years. I've uh, raised three kids, been married to my wife for 21 years. I uh, went to Johns Hopkins University, uh, where I got a management's degree. Um, I want to be able to, you know, get in touch with the, the voters and get in touch with the constituents of the district. Um, again, um, I think that the people in D.C. are not staying and communicating with us, so that we have to start creating a bond and, and, and being able to have your voice be heard. Um, again, I want to champion my cause towards the working class. Uh, right now, there's close to 40% of society is not paying taxes. And ultimately, we're taking on the burden, and we need to find a way to make that work for us rather than constantly having us dig in our pockets to pay for society and all the uh, different programs that are not sustainable or affordable. Um, I've taken an oath to office twice, again, for the Marine Corps and the State Police, and I plan on bringing honor, honor integrity, accountability, and service to every, every single one of you. I won't let you down. And I plan on taking that with the conservative values. Um, I'm running a grassroots campaign. I'm an outsider, and I have no political ties, uh, special interests, or uh, lobbyists supporting me. Thank you. Mr. Goff. My name is Jonathan Goff, and uh, I'm from Hartford County, Maryland. I was a landscaper for 26 years for Target, Home Depot, Johns Hopkins. And I'm as mad as everybody else in this room. Congress has failed us, and that's why I'm here. Our borders are wide open. We have illegal immigrants running all over our country. We're being invaded. This is ridiculous. Every time we talk about immigration, it's like we'll just talk about it later on. And I'm sorry, but we have sanctuary cities that are funded. We have to defund those sanctuary cities. We have to get our immigration under control. My wife is from Ukraine. We met in the Ukraine. So I know all about what it's like in a third world country. She's one of our leading engineers at University of Maryland Hospital. She, bought, she takes care of all the medical equipment for 15 hospitals. And if you end up in shock trauma, she'll be one of those persons that probably helps save your life. And I'll tell you right now, our veterans, they're not being taken care of. And Iran is out of control. They're not doing what they said that they were going to do. Again, Congress failed us. They let Obama spend $10 trillion of our money. This has got to stop. We got to get our government back under control again. We need people for the people. We the people. And we have to uphold our Constitution because they're throwing our Constitution right out the door. And we need a voice. And our voice has got to be votes. Again, I'm from Hartford County, Jonathan Golf. And go to my website, Golf for Congress, and you'll learn a little bit more about me. Thank you. Thank you. Now, the first question, I'm going to start with Mr. Harris. These are questions that are in your program. And this one is about immigration. Do you support a path to citizenship for the 11 million undocumented people currently in the U.S.? 
If you are in favor of deportation, how would you manage the process? If you are opposed, what is your alternative to deportation? Thank you very much. And obviously a question that's on the minds of a lot of people around the country as we look at uh, you know, what's going on in the presidential race. You know, as a son, as a son of immigrants, I, I, I think I guess I'm probably the only one up here who is, uh, I realize the importance of immigration to the United States. I mean, the fact of the matter is that, you know, if you trace almost everyone in America far enough back, there was an immigrant involved. But the immigration has to be orderly and it has to be legal. A nation is defined by its borders. A borders only means something if you're willing to enforce a border. This is a great country. There are billions of people around the world who want to come to this country. It can't happen. It has to happen in an organized, legal fashion. So the answer to the question, oh, do I support a path to citizenship? No, I don't support a path to citizenship. If you came here illegally, you can't be rewarded with citizenship. Citizenship in the United States is something to be uh, prized and treasured. There are billions of people around the world who want to be citizens in the United States but you can't enter illegally. So no, I don't support a pathway. That being said, do I think you have to have, do, do, you, have, uh, do you have to have immigrants? Sure you have to have immigrants in several categories. First of all, like my parents, refugees from areas where you literally can't go back. They have to be vetted. So when, when the president proposed expanding, for instance, refugees from Syria, I supported and co-sponsored the bill that said no, you actually have to make sure that the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI signs off on those, that they can vet that the people who come in aren't dangerous. So you have a vetting process, but we've never, America's never closed its doors to refugees and it shouldn't. The other thing that you have to do is you have to make sure that we have a temporary workforce for doing jobs that Americans just simply won't do. And here on the shore it's incredibly important, whether it's the, whether it's the seafood industry, poultry processing industry, or the tourism industry. So we need an H-2B program, but we need our temporary visas to be enforced. You come here temporarily, you work, and then you return back home. If you want to come and stay, there's a process. Get in line, apply, and go through the process. Thank you. Mr. Jackson. Okay. Uh, in regards to the pathway for citizens for illegals, uh, again, I'm against it. Um, if you're here in the United States, you need to be here through the proper legal means. Um, if you come here illegally, th again, it, it'd be uh, nearly impossible to try to um, gather up 15 million illegal aliens and, and deport them um, back to Mexico. But I, I do believe we, there, again, there's a lot of arduous jobs out there, uh, especially with the, the industries over here on the Eastern Shore where um, we do need to offer up the jobs initially to the unemployed individuals and unemployed Americans first. Um, if they turn down the jobs, then we need to remove them from the welfare program or from unemployment, uh, 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 being recipients of unemployment. Clearly, the job is not uh, necessary for them, enough for them to want to work. So in that case, that's when you offer up as a secondary category the H-2B visas to the seasonal workers. But again, they do, it does have to be enforced. If they're here past that stage, again, if, we, if they're in contact with law enforcement at any point, we need to start the process through with um, immigrations to have them removed. Um, Thank you. Mr. Goff? Well, I'm against the pathway, and there is a right way and a wrong way to handle immigration. And we all know, everybody in this room, we all know that when they come over here to work, they don't return home. We end up footing the bill. Comes out of your paycheck, our taxes. And the other thing is... Um, in the past six years, the real numbers, 510,000 American H-1B visas have been handed out to foreigners. Now, H-1B visas are master's degree, bachelor's degree jobs. They are giving our jobs away. On one hand of the government's mouth, they're sitting there saying we need jobs, but on the other, other side of their mouth, they're, they're handing out that many jobs. This has got to stop. We got all these Americans out of work. Now, H-2B visas, we, we need farm workers that, to, to do the jobs. And yes, they can come here, work, and then go back. But ICE, and we all know, ICE is not doing their job. Our government is failing us, and they have been failing us. They're not doing the job on the borders. Obama's telling them, don't arrest them. And now the latest that I'm getting out of Mexico, people from Mexico, this is just last week, that they come over to the United States, 
They turn themselves in, and then they're given a court date, and they don't show up for the court date. And guess what? They stay here, and they're all over our country. They're not vetted. They're bringing over diseases, measles, mumps, tuberculosis. I mean, you name it, they're bringing it. So you think about that. I know a person right now, she's in the hospital fighting for her life with H1N1 virus. Fighting for her life. Four cases have been known to be brought into Maryland in the past month. So we got to do something about our immigration. Thank you. Mr. Schmeichel. I do support the legal method of coming to this country. It has worked for 100 years. You go, you get a visa, you come here. You learn the culture. You learn about our history. You learn the language. A simulation, not multiculturalism. And I think it is disingenuous of the congressman to say that he is against this immigration, or he stands against it, when he voted under the Cromnibus Bill of 2014 to fund the president's unconstitutional amnesty for tens of millions of illegal immigrants in this country. You can't go vote to give the funding to let that take place and then say, I'm against it. You either stand up and say, I'm against it, and don't vote to fund them so that they can come in illegally under the president's extra authority that is not in the Constitution. He went out and said, I'm going to grant an amnesty, and he had no constitutional authority to do that. And then the congressman joins in and says, well, I'm going to get, go ahead and vote for that. That's wrong. You don't get to come here and say, I'm against it, yet you voted to let in tens of millions and to fund it. And that's the problem with Congress today. We can look you in the eye, we can tell you we're against something, and then we can go down there and vote for just the opposite. You don't get to do that. And so when I go down there, I'm going to do just like I did in the Maryland House of Delegates. When the congressman and I were both in the legislature together, he voted for in-state tuition for illegal immigrants. I voted against in-state tuition for illegal immigrants. And I will continue to do as I'm telling you here and do exactly as I promised. And I won't vote one way and then tell you I'm for something else. Thank you. Thank you. The second question, which I'm going to start with Mr. Jackson, is about health care. Would you support the continuation of the Affordable Care Act? If not, what would you support in its place, if anything? Okay. Uh, no, I do not support Obamacare. Uh, it, basically, every study that's out there, it tells us that it's not sustainable. It's way too, uh, too costly for the United States and the taxpayers. It's destroying small businesses. So therefore, I'm completely against Obamacare. I am, um, I am open to an uh, open competitive market uh, to allow for uh, medical programs to be competitive not just statewide, but again, almost like what Trump was saying, where it's open borders, where it's throughout the United States, to allow competing programs to go against each other, to allow for uh, a cheaper source for us to have competing markets, um, and then uh, therefore it'd work out a lot better for us, rather than having the government dictate to us what type of program we have to pay into, uh, whether we have our own medical programs through our employers, but additionally, through taxes, having to pay for this type of program, it's just not cost effective. Thank you. Mr. Goff. Obamacare is going to crash, and we all know it. Everybody I talk to in Washington, they all tell me the same thing, that it just can't hold its own. The, the pharmacy end of it, it does, the numbers don't add up, and it's not going to sustain itself. I, I just can't see Obamacare working, so we need to replace Obamacare. And that's all it is to it. Well, here's what we got to replace it with. Now, you're saying with what? But what is there now? Right now, we have seniors paying for benefits they don't need. And as far as replacing it, we have to look into it. I, I, you know, I have asked myself so many questions. How are we going to replace it, and what are we going to replace it with? Well, that's a good question. We all have the same questions on that one. But I, I, I'm, not, I'm not the best at the Obamacare issue, okay? So, but the thing is, we do have to replace it. We have to work on it. This is not right for any of us. It's going to, it, it's going to crash on us. So let's, uh, we have to look into replacing this Obamacare, and it's not, uh, it's not the thing for the country. And I, I, I think that we can come up with a better plan. 
but we have to look into it. I don't have the answers for the Obamacare replacement, but we have to start work, working on it. Ask anybody here. It's something that's difficult. We're going to have to look into replacing Obamacare with all these recipients already in Obamacare. Thank you. Mr. Schmigo, please. Excuse me, please, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I sponsored the bill in Maryland to repeal Obamacare, and I would never have voted to fully fund it, as was in the Cromnibus bill, as the congressman did. So when he tells you he's against Obamacare, it never would have happened had not Republicans stood up and voted to fully fund that. That was wrong. You want to know what we should do? Well, it's very simple. You go and use the HSAs that we have, the health savings accounts, which in Maryland they limited to $6,100. You raise those. If you go to employers and you say every dollar you invest in the health programs for your employees is going to be tax deductible, how many employers do you know that wouldn't take the $10,000 that they would have been paying in tax and insure their employees? You remove the barriers between the states. Right now, you can't go to Texas and buy the best plan and bring it here to Maryland because we put up artificial barriers in Congress. So if you remove those, go to an open market system. Let the free enterprise system work and use capitalism. You'll have security. You'll have certainty. And make it portable so you can take it with you. The only question that people had is how do you take care of pre-existing illnesses? And you can do that. You can, you can make it so that you take care of the pre-existing. You make it portable. The idea that when they tell you these numbers now, and they come out and say, well, we've got, we've got 9 million more people on the Obama, uh, insurance. But 200 million people have lost a better insurance. When you take people and you say that we put 9 million people on the insurance, what you've done is put some of them into the Medicare or Medicaid program. You've taken them off a of better insurance that they had. We've ruined the best insurance um, we ruined the best medical system in the entire world, and we've made it so that financially, we've made it so that financially we will not be able to survive. And we had the best medical system in the world. We don't now. Please, I want to caution you. We're here to listen, and we won't be able to listen if we have a lot of noise from the audience. So I hope you'll cooperate and give May these people who came an opportunity to speak. May I finish? I'm sorry. Thank you. The, the, the point is that it could have been stopped. It never had to take place. But the congressman voted for that. He said fully fund it, gave the vote under the common bill, and that allowed it to take place. So you don't get to sit here now and say, I'm against Obamacare, but I voted to fund it. Thank you. Thank Mr. You. Harris. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I detect a pattern here. Uh, I think the former delegate is going to look at my 3,600 votes, pick out one out of context, one or two, and then mislead you on them. Let me tell you about the Cromnibus bill. The Cromnibus bill funded the entire government, and as a matter of fact, with regards to immigration, it didn't fully fund the president's program. The, the delegate, I suggest, he should read the bill before he comments on it. It funded it through February when the leadership promised that we would, as we did, pass H.R. 240 with restrictions on the DACA program, which the Senate rejected. And when it came back from the Senate, I voted against it. Just the facts. Uh, when you talk about Obamacare, the fact of the matter is the omnibus bill did one of the most important things uh, to the Affordable Care Act that we could have done, which is a suggestion that um, Senator Rubio put in the bill, which is that we don't take two, two and a half billion dollars of taxpayer money and subsidize the insurance companies. It stripped out the insurance company subsidy, two and a half billion dollars. That's not fully funding, but again, if the delegate had read the bill, it might have been a different story. Let's talk a little about, about the Affordable Care Act. There are parts of the Affordable Care Act that are important. And again, on this issue, look, you don't have to believe me. The Congressional Research Service has the over 50 votes I've taken against the Affordable Care Act and various parts of it. So when the delegate says that I, that I fully supported it, I think you know better. H.R. 26, uh, 2653, those of you who are interested in the, in the alternative, look at the one that I co-sponsored, helped write, H.R. 2653, the Amer American Health Care Reform Act that does truly innovative things, like increase NIH funding so that we can actually cure or attempt to cure Alzheimer's, heart disease, stroke, cancer, the, the diabetes, the things that, we re that really affect our health care, that we uh, allow uh, purchase across state lines, that we, that we expand the uh, health savings accounts, while we retain 
the coverage for pre-existing conditions up to age 21 and, the, uh, and, 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 and eliminate the annual caps. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Okay, so the third question, which we'll start with Mr. Gaw. What measures would you vote for to improve the quality of the Chesapeake Bay, including its tributaries and wetlands? Okay, for one, um, there are programs out there that these farmers uh, have in place right now. And what happens, what, one of the guys that I know that's on the eastern shore has a big farm. He's got the runoffs from his, his fields, his crops, and they're going into these, these, these small sediment ponds on both sides. And what he does is by the time it gets all the way down, and he, he actually reuses the water, you know, for his crops. Okay, so it goes, you know, out to the outside sediment ponds, goes down, and then he, re he waters, he uses those sediment ponds to water his crops again, and it takes care of about 70% of the rain runoff for the Chesapeake Bay. And I presented this to Larry Hogan. So I'm hoping that Larry Hogan will listen to this plan. Um, another issue is the Conowingo Dam. Now, a lot of our problems and sediments are coming downstream from this, the, the Conowingo Dam. And it's a mess. And, and in fact, the power from Conowingo Dam is actually feeding New Jersey. And, but yet you, New Jersey doesn't want to refurbish the, the Conowingo Dam. They want Marylanders to pay for all that, which they get the electricity. So we have to work with our northern states, which is what, where we're having most of our problems. Okay, that's where we're getting all the, the sediments and, and the runoffs. So we have to start mandating that the northern states, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, start working to clean up their act so, because all this is coming down into our Chesapeake Bay. So if you have any more questions about that, I mean, like I was a landscaper and I took care of all the sediment ponds for, for Home Depot, for Target, so. Thank you, Mr. Right. Gall. Now we've come to the time uh, for the questions from the floor, and I wanted to say that. <coughs> None of us got the rest of the questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Got it, yeah. I'm sorry. So, environment. Thank you very much. Um, first off, though, I want you all to go and get your Googles out and look at the Cromnibus Bill 2014. Not the Cromnibus Bill 2015, which the Congressman is citing to. 2014 he did vote for, and he did vote for full funding of the um, medical uh, uh, under the Obamacare. Now, on the issue with regards to the Bay, you have to stop what's happening with the sediment and the nitrogen coming over the Conowingo Dam. In 2012, I went out there and we had a press conference and it was after a report came out from the US Geological Survey that said the problem was not private property owners, farmers or business owners, it was the Conowingo Dam and what was coming over. And what just happened? Congressman Harris supported a bill to kill oversight of the Conowingo Dam pollution coming into the Bay and in favor of Exelon, his fourth biggest contributor. He said, Let's take MDE out of the picture and let the feds look at it. MDE was in there saying, no, clean this up. There, the 85% the of the filled reservoirs behind it, which bring tons of the pollutions down into the bay. Remember after Sandy? You look at the pictures, there was a 100-mile plume of a chocolate color sediment going down into the bay. And that was because they hadn't cleaned that up. So why favor Exelon, a big corporation, over all of us, six out of the seven counties that are on the bay who are paying billions of dollars for the cleanup are in the first district? The congressman's duty should have been to make sure that that MDE had the right to say that the water coming over that bay is clean and not vote to take them out of it. And I would not do that. I stood there and said that they need to clean this up back in 2012, and I stand there now. When we had a problem here with going, what was going on with uh, Unicorn Lake, we came out here and fought to fix Unicorn Lake. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Harris. I guess the pattern continues. Uh, Mr. Smeagol, read the bill. And I'll, I'll read verbatim the committee, what the committee says 
that bill did. It says the bill doesn't change state's ability to deny, grant, or condition the application under the Clean Water Act. What the bill does is change the timeline by requiring court approval if a state is extending review past the one-year deadline. Under the bill, if a state denies the water certification, that would be MDE, FERC could not grant the license because the applicant would be operating in violation of the Clean Water Act for failing to obtain the required permit. That bill didn't do that. It said that the states have a year. A year is a long time. A state can't take more. But let's talk about what that bill really was about. Because that was only one provision. I, I must have been put in by some representatives up in the Northeast where water power is important. Believe me, if I had found out about it from the, because then come to my committee, I'm not in the committee of jurisdiction, I would have put in the amendment. We would have even taken that language out that, res that restricted for a year. But what the bill did is it set up our grid, grid security in the United States. Those of you who follow grid security know EMP is a, a real threat to us. What it does, it says, for instance, it, allow, it, it uh, actually told the uh, uh, local power authorities that they can actually uh, uh, create a, a storehouse of transformers, because that's what's, that's what's vulnerable to an EMP attack. So it actually was a grid security bill. So you know what? It retained, the state retained the rights. The state has to act within a year. If the state rejected it, it would be rejected, and then the company would have to go back and reapply. It didn't take the states out of it. Let's talk about uh, cleaning up the bay. The most important thing is that we do it through the agriculture, uh, the agriculture department, not through the EPA. Because the way it works is you get all the stakeholders in together. This is what Larry Hogan did with the PMTs, with the phosphorus management tool. That's the way that works. If we do it through the, uh, through the agriculture department, through the National Resource Conservation Service and their programs, We'll get everybody to buy into it, and everybody will work together to, to preserve the beautiful bay. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Jackson. All right. All right. Uh, in regards to the bay, um, right now, I think they're being overregulated with the farming industry and the watermen, that it makes it tough for them to do their jobs. Um, I think we need to restrict what the EPA is doing to our farmers. I think they're doing an excellent job in trying to uh, keep nitrates and nitrogens from going into the water and, and destroying the industry for the, uh, for the watermen. Um, but here in Maryland, first of all, we need to repeal the rain tax, flush tax, and in regards to the bay restoration tax from MVA, we need to make sure that if it's not repealed in the sense that a lot of different counties, the citizens are paying a lot of money in those type of programs and we can never verify that the funding was actually coming to the state of Maryland in the sense of being paid it being directed towards this program and cleaning the bay um, I think the citizens shouldn't have to pay for those type of programs what I think we, we need to do and at a government level US government level is to look at it in a more of a macro sense in the sense that we need to look at Pennsylvania and how the government can regulate Pennsylvania because we could do everything great here in Maryland and having us all pay for the program to keep uh, to keep the the bay clean but yet if we got a lot of runoff coming down from Pennsylvania ultimately we're spinning our wheels and spending an awful lot of money to keep the bay clean so we need to look at it in a more of a sense of where's that water coming from and how it's being filtered into our bay um, we need to work closely with the, with the, um, the um, agricultural, um, the attorney general's office, the MDE. We need to identify industry or big industry that's our biggest pollutants, and we need to uh, address them and have them assist in the cleanup. Thank you. Mr. Gall. He answered it first. Sorry. Oh, sorry. All right. I can answer some more. <laughs> You'll get another question. <laughs> okay. Um, I just wanted to mention that I'm taking these questions pretty much as they've come to me. In other words, I'm not for taking one from the bottom of the pile and putting it on the top, okay? So, um, Mr. Schmiegel, this is uh, the next question. Geographically, District 1 includes all of nine Eastern Shore counties plus parts of Hartford, Baltimore, and Carroll counties. How does a representative balance the very diverse needs of such a large area? Well, I think that uh, they're not really that diverse. The needs, uh, if you, I've been to all the counties, I've held a town hall in every single county. Yesterday was actually the last two. I uh, was in the morning in Somerset and I was in Kent uh, two and a half hours later. So we, I've been to every county and they all have agricultural needs. They all want to have jobs. They all want to have uh, a clean environment. 
So I don't see a real big difference from going from Ocean City uh, out to Carroll County in what the people want. They want to be able to have health care available to them, and they want to be able to get a job that's over 30 hours so that they can support their families, uh, but they can't do that currently because the employers don't want to employ anybody because of the mandates that are there from Obamacare. There are things that uh, unite us all, and so I don't really see it being a problem of uh, being able to represent the first district. The interests are uh, very similar. We're in agricultural communities. Um, we uh, want to be able to have employment here in Maryland, have people come here, and we have the same needs for security and uh, happiness. And so uh, Maryland is America in miniature, and if we can go to Congress and represent the interest of America, we can go to Congress and represent the interest of the first district. It's, I don't see it as being that diverse that it can't be handled. Thank you. Mr. Harris. You know, the, the first congressional district does span all the way from, uh, well, from Ocean City to Tawnytown up in Carroll County, halfway across the Pennsylvania border. It's a large district, but it, you know, as the, as the former delegate says, it is, it is uniform in that it's, it's rural and then deep suburban. So it has a lot of things in common, but it has many things that aren't in common. For instance, there's no poultry industry over in Carroll County or in Baltimore County or Harford County. Uh, there's no tourism industry in that part of the district. There are no watermen over in that part of the district. So there does need to be particular attention paid to the needs of the Eastern Shore of Maryland because those, those needs are very particular. And on those three issues, I've, I've attempted in, in the past five years, and I think my record will show my support from those, those groups, uh, that I have paid attention to those needs. Uh, that, you know, it's a large district. I, I've put 40,000 miles a year on my, I never thought I'd be driving that much. I mean, I used to just sit in an operating room, do anesthesia. That was my life. Now it seems I live in a car driving. But it's a great district, very diverse, very many needs. And, you know, the congressman has to pay attention to all that. There are a lot of balls up in the air at any given point in time. Again, 3,600 votes in five years. Uh, it's a lot of things you've got to pay attention to. But look, that's what you hire your congressman to do. That's the bottom line. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Jackson. Okay. Uh, yes, with uh, the district being 12 counties, it, it is a very large district, four and a half hours to uh, traverse from Carroll County down to Somerset. Uh, I make that trip quite frequently in the last few months, and uh, again, it is a lot of miles. But what, the one thing I did find uh, talking with the different citizens and the voters from Tawny Town all the way down to Pocomoke City was there, there was one thing that they all complained about. They did not have access to their representative. Oftentimes they would call the, the uh, incumbents uh, different locations, uh, his offices, and they would get uh, someone that would give them a very vague answer or it didn't respond to their answers and or they would get responses via uh, the internet, uh, just an email reply that again didn't address their uh, initial concerns or their questions that they had for the representative. Uh, that's where I'd like to change it. I would want each and every one of you to have uh, direct access to me. I know that's tough, but you know what? I mean, that's why we're here. That's why we're supposed to be running for office so that you will have direct access to us and not one of our employees that are going to give you just a generic answer and hopefully you'll stop calling. Um, again, all of them are, are the same in a sense. They want to raise their family. They want to reduce taxes. Uh, they just want to be able to be safe and, and raise their families in, the, in this beautiful district that we have. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Goff. Well, what do we all have in common? Gasoline. Our gas prices are so important to all of us in every district, in every county. And what I'm afraid of is these gas prices soaring out of control. Saudi Arabia is just playing with us, supply and demand. You know, we go to the gas pump. Each and every one of us go to those gas pumps. And that means a lot to me. I mean, that to me, gas prices are controlling our currency's value. We have fishermen that, that rely on those gas prices. We have crabber, crabbers that, that rely on those gas prices. And every industry in America relies on gas prices. Now... I'm here, the latest I'm hearing is Saudi Arabia is coming over into the United States and buying up our farmers' lands. I don't want that to happen. I don't think anybody from another country or another country should own farms in the United States. And it should not, it should be stopped. Now, here we are, we're protecting Saudi Arabia with our hard-earned tax dollar money. 
Now, they should pay us back. You know, they need to pay America back. Our, our debt is going on $19.5 trillion. And Congress keeps spending and giving Obama everything he wants. This has got to stop. So think about that. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Harris, this question is um, directed to you, and then, um, then I'll ask others to comment. Mr. Harris, what legislation have you sponsored that has brought jobs to the Eastern Shore? Wow, you know, I sit on the Appropriations Committee, which is a little different committee because it's, it, I'd have to go, I'd have to go through the civics of it. There, you know, there are two kinds of committees in Congress, what's called an authorizing committee, which deals with legislation, and then what's called the Appropriations Committee, which deals with the spending. So actually, when you sit on the Appropriations Committee, what, what, the, what the important, uh, you don't, you don't, co-sponsor legislation, what you do is you write amendments to the appropriations bill. So what you do is you take the appropriations bills and you try to help your districts by changing how the government is spending money in a given year. So for instance, we, we suggested language when the phosphorus management tool was going to come down the, down the line, which actually the way it was originally proposed uh, would have devastated the farmers on the lower shore. Uh, basically you would have had to have planted crops and not be allowed to put any uh, fertilizer down. Uh, phosphorus, those of you who aren't familiar with phosphorus, it, it, it stays in the entire soil column, but of course plants only have access to it in the top part of the soil column. So if you couldn't put any phosphorus down, it, even though the phosphorus in the soil was deep, your crop wouldn't grow. So, the, the, so what, I, what I did is I proposed, for instance, language to the Agriculture Appropriations Bill, uh, or it might, might have been the Environmental Bill, the EPA, that basically wouldn't allow the government to, to fund, fund a program that didn't allow, didn't allow a farmer to put at least some fertilizer, an amount of fertilizer equal to the amount that a crop was shown to take up. That kind of makes sense. You're not adding uh, phosphorus to the soil. You're just putting down what a crop would take up. It's those kind of things. For instance, with the with on uh, poultry is very important to our uh, to our uh, economy on the eastern shore. And there was a regulation called GIPSA, G-I-P-S-A, uh, that would have affected our poultry growers and our ability of poultry industry to remain viable on the shore. So I so I put an amendment into an appropriations bill again, the agriculture appropriations bill that restricted that. So that's the kind of thing that appropriate, when you sit on the Appropriations Committee do. It's amendments to bills that restrict how the government is spending money in ways that would harm your district. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Jackson, did you want to comment? Um, well, I, I know for us, for the uh, for way I think uh, in regards to bringing jobs here to Maryland, um, one of the things that I'm looking at is basically having a, a fair flat tax for business. Uh, right now, the small businesses, which really take up our 12 counties, are being devastated again with Obamacare and different taxation bills that are or their taxation rates uh, with corporate tax close to 39 percent uh, a lot of small businesses are unable to to maintain and stay uh, stay active um, therefore they end up falling down and, and uh, the re reduction of jobs because it can't keep uh, uh, amount of employees that they would like to have. Uh, so if we could have a fair business tax uh, at around 16%, um, that would make it more affordable and therefore bring in more jobs and retain jobs in the county or in the district. Thank you. Mr. Goff. Well, for one, Congress is, again, failing us in that region, too, because the tariffs that these other countries are putting on America are ridiculous. They're tariffing American products, and we're not tariffing their products. And it just isn't fair. You know, it, 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 and China is, is bringing all their products in the United States at, at, at no cost, but yet we can't take in, we bring products into China and they, and they tariff us to no end. And then the EPA, our, our, our companies inside the United States are having problems paying all the fees from the EPA. So we, we, we really need to take a look at the EPA. I, I was a landscaper for 26 years. I, I get it. I, I get the environment. Believe me, I plant more trees and flowers than you can ever imagine. So, you know, we, we really have to take a look at, uh, you know, how to clean up our environment, plus not go overboard, okay? We have to be business friendly, you know, especially to small businesses because they're getting hammered. And I think that we could do a better job with the, with the, with the, with the taxes that they're, they're paying. Flat tax is a good idea. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Schmeagel. 
Um, I also have votes that you can check. I got over 20,000 votes over the 12 years I was in the legislature. So go take a look at them. Some of the votes that I put in to propose to bring jobs here and also help with the environment is you heard recently the talk about a monorail. Well, I proposed that back in 2007 and it would, would have run right down the middle of the 50, uh, I 50 corridor so that you wouldn't have to buy land and you would be able to put people in on the western shore over in Anne Arundel County. They would get on there and would drag them over and drop them off on Kent Island, then in Salisbury, then Ocean City. You'd be able to move the people that way and eventually move it down to Baltimore and down to D.C. Get the trucks off the road, you get the jobs for building that. The Oystermen's Association, when they came to me and said we were having a problem, I said start your own group, start your own Oystermen's Association to help protect the jobs of the Oystermen here on the Eastern Shore and who are working. And so I started that association. Um, now, it's a little, again, uh, surprising. The congressman did more to get rid of jobs here than he did to help. The bill that he sponsored was H.R. 3918, and that was to let 264,000 HB2 workers in here. Last year it was 66,000. Those aren't jobs that we don't want to take on the Eastern Shore. They include truck driving and such. So who here wouldn't want to get a job as a truck driver at sixty or $80,000 a year? You can't get it if you got people coming in on these H-2B visas, 264000 as opposed to 60000 previously. So you need to make sure that when you're down there, you read the bill and you do what you need to do to bring the jobs here and not to drive the jobs out. Thank you. Now, the next question, um, changing the subject a bit now, uh, is, and I'm going to start with Mr. Jackson. In light of the hunger problem here on the shore, where one child in five go to bed hungry, where do you stand on the subject of food stamps? Well, in regards to food stamps, uh, the, the U.S. Uh, government pays out uh, millions and millions of dollars uh, in food stamp programs, WIC, uh, independent cards. Uh, oftentimes, those programs are in scrutiny because they are being abused by people, recipients that don't need to be on it, shouldn't be on it. Um, what I would like to do, instead of having all these individuals that are in their welfare program constantly having uh, their own independence to spend at will, because the different programs are showing that in some cases, uh, last year it was shown, I believe it was CNN or one of them, one of the different um, reporting networks, it talked about uh, individuals spending it on alcohol, spending it on cigarettes, different stuff other than uh, the sustenance of food for their children. So what I would like to do is have more or less uh, take those type of independent cards, WIC cards, food stamp programs away from the individuals. And what we do is invest in, in local regionalized um, food banks, of uh, uh, different soup kitchens, stuff of that nature, where we can guarantee that the funding that is going to those programs is going to be available to them and it will be utilized by them. They'll have food services and hot meals ready for them, and then they still have the option to take at the food bank to take food home with them rather than giving them the freedom to spend at will. Thank you. Mr. Goff. Well, <laughs> what's common sense? got just about the last numbers I was getting was we got 66 million illegals running around the United States and we're feeding so we need to clean up our immigration first and then secondly I can't believe that they're gonna bring in these Syrian refugees especially without even being vetted first how about taking care of us Americans first because that's what I stand for us Americans first we're rebuilding other countries and we can't feed our own? Is this ridiculous? Come on. I mean, where's the common sense in Washington? It's like they forgot about us Americans. You know, this has got to stop. You know, look at the money we're spending on all these, the, the foreigners that are coming in illegally in this country. It's ridiculous. And the court times and how much we pay all these attorneys to take care of all the illegal immigration because ICE is not doing their job. And we got an administration who just really doesn't care about us Americans. So if you want my opinion, I, I'm for us Americans first. And we shouldn't have hungry children running around America, you know, when we got uh, everybody, uh, anchor babies coming to the United States. They're, they're coming to the United States and visiting the United States and having babies. And next thing you know, they're American citizens. This is, 
This is ridiculous. This has got to stop. And they're really not American citizens. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Schmeagel. As I told you when we started here, I grew up very poor. Um, I know what the taste of government cheese was like when you get a big old block when you were a kid. Um, I had the food stamps that, that you had to go to school to get your uh, lunch with, and it was embarrassing. But you know what I, I, I learned is not dependency. I didn't learn that I was entitled. I learned that when I was 12 years old, if I wanted something, I had to go out and shine shoes to sell newspapers to get money to be able to feed my family. As I told you, my mother was disabled, she worked. No child should go hungry on the Eastern Shore. We need to take care of them. Where we go wrong is making people dependent upon those things. We need to be able to get them trained to be a new job if they can't do their own job, and to get them employed so that they can earn. I don't have a problem taking care of people who are unable to care for themselves. I have a problem making people dependent on receiving things from the state. Now, when I was in the Marine Corps, I also had a roofing job. You know, when I was in college, I worked midnight to eights, so I could then go to school during the days. There's nothing wrong with learning how to work hard and to be able to uh, earn what you get. And so I, if we have children on the Eastern Shore that don't have, then we need in the first district to take care of those children. But we need to also make sure that their parents have the ability to go out and earn a living. And so we have to make it so that they can get a job that they can support their families on. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Harris. Thank you. Uh, food stamps, uh, I guess it really is uh, the Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, it's SNAP is the, is the new name for it, is really one of the uh, largest growing entitlements in the federal government over the last decade. In fact, it's, it's, uh, it's more than doubled in the amount. It, it, it's outpaced Social Security and Medicare in terms of its growth. Uh, in large part because in 2008, during the, st in the stimulus bill, uh, the, a lot of the requirements were removed uh, or restrictions on who could uh, receive food stamps. So we have record numbers. We have about 40 million people in the country. No one is going to deny, no one on this, on this table is going to deny that, that you know, someone who is hungry, that a hungry child in America shouldn't be fed. But I have voted, you know, some of those 3,600 votes I took were to say that, you know what, in return for food stamps, if you're an able-bodied adult, not a child, able-bodied adult, you have to work, train, or seek employment. That should, that should be pretty, again, an able body. Not if you have a disability, not if you're a senior, not if you're a child. And that was rejected by the Democrat minority in the House. It was, it was rejected, that, that idea. I, we, we will never, ever, ever pay off our debt and reduce our deficit if we don't do what I think are common sense approaches to programs like that. Make sure the safety net's there. But for heaven's sake, expect an able-bodied adult to work, train, or seek a job in return for using our tax dollars. The second thing that's very, that I, I, I teamed up with uh, Dr. Phil Rowe from Tennessee, and we proposed that you put the same restriction on what food you can get in the food stamp program that we do on the Women, Infant, and Children's program, the WIC program. Those of you who are familiar know it has to be highly nutritious food. No junk food, highly nutritious food. We think the same thing should be true if you're, if you're using food stamps. You should, be, you should be going to the store and you're not buying soda pop, you're buying nutritious food with, with it. Uh, we think that makes sense. I still think that makes sense. That's, that, and that's a tough, uh, that's a tough thing to, to pull off in Washington because you do have a lot of vested interests down there who like the food stamp program right now because of the wide variety of things you can obtain with it that are not necessarily nutritious. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to start with Mr. Goff. Mm -hmm. What is your position on abortion? I'm going to write the labor from conception. And that's it. Thank you. Mr. Schmeichel? I have a 100% rating from Maryland Right to Life for every one of the 12 years I've been in the legislature, and I'm proud of it. I'm a right to life. Mr. Harris? Uh, I'm pro-life. Of the people on the stage, I'm the only one who's in, is endorsed by the Maryland Right to Life and by National Right to Life. And I just want to read, because I have two minutes here, read because uh, one of the people on the stage, you can guess which one, was criticizing my voting record on the Cromnibus as somehow funding abortion. Uh, it was something uh, this person said in a town hall, one of these town hall events up in Elkton, where he's quoted as saying that uh, I, vote, I voted to, fund, to, to, to use federal funds to pay for abortion. This is a letter from the National Right to Life Committee. I think they're the authorities on who's pro-life and who's not. They said this charge is utterly false. 
To put the most charitable interpretation upon Mr. Smeagol's statement, he is grossly misinformed. That's all I'll say. A lot of, you know, again, this is, you know, this is like, those of you who've seen the movie Groundhog Day, this is like the same thing. Uh, each and every time one of these cromnibus votes comes up, you know, I'm accused of not being pro-life because I vote for, the, for, for a bill that, you know, has, you know, a trillion dollars of funding across the whole entire federal government. Without reminding you that Mr. Smeagol voted for one of Mr. O'Malley's budget, which fully funded sanctuary cities, fully funded uh, Planned Parenthood and Medicaid abortions. I mean, again, I don't play that game because you deserve the truth about what my voting record is and the thought I put into, into, into the votes. The fact of the matter is I'm pro-life, I'm proud of it. I think uh, human life begins at conception. We want to do everything we can in this society to protect that, realizing there are difficult situations. Women, are, women find themselves in difficult situations sometimes. We have to realize that. But I'm pro-life. Thank you. I believe it's Mr. Jackson. Yes. Uh, I'm also right to life. Um, I don't believe that government should be uh, funding any type of uh, abortions. Um, I believe that it's a private matter between the woman and her doctor in a private setting in the doctor's office, and the government should not be in that room dictating how what they're going to pay for it and uh, work out the finances on it. Uh, that, again, should not, the government should not be involved, and again, I am for right for life. Thank you. Now a general question but probably pretty relevant. And it starts with Mr. Schmiegel, I believe. How do you propose to put Congress back to work? Well, I put Congress back to work by starting stopping congressmen who come in here and lie to you. Because the lady who I talked to at CPAC about the right to life and said, how could you possibly give the congressman 100% vote when he voted on the Commonwealth Bill to expand the abortion to the Peace Corps workers who never had it before? She said, I didn't read the Commonwealth Bill. When I asked her how she could possibly give the congressman 100% vote when he voted to give $4.7 million to Planned Parenthood, she said, we didn't didn't count that bill. I, when I asked her how when the congressman stood there with me outside of Planned Parenthood and then said, if you want to sell body parts, it's, okay, it's just fine as long as you don't use government money. I said, do you, do you justify that? She said, I don't want to look at the film. So when the woman stood there and told me from the national right to life that she was not going to count his votes, wasn't going to look at his votes, I said, shame on you. I'm going to point you out and call you out because what you're doing is putting politics ahead of policy, of principle. And so when the congressman sits here and tells you that, go look it up yourself. Everybody's got Google now. You can look at the Commonwealth Bill and you can see what it did. You can see what all of the leading organizations wrote about that. You don't get to say, well, it was important and I had to go ahead and make all these bad votes. You shouldn't count them. And it's not just a Commonwealth Bill. I put that there because you can only put so much space on something. So what I'm going to do about Congress is make sure that the people go down there, don't get to look at you in the eye and tell you one thing and do another and expect you to believe it. It comes from our leaders. We have to tell the truth. You know what? You don't agree with me. I'm going to tell you the truth. And we'll have a discussion as to why I did it. I won't lie. I won't mislead you. And I won't try to do a fancy shuffle so that you can't find out what I really did, because it's there. Go look it up, and you can go to SmeagolForCongress.com, and you can see the truth, and then ask the congressman to come back and explain why he just told you falsehoods. Thank you. Mr. Harris. <laughs> Here we go again. I'll read National Right to Life. This is not some person at CPAC. This is dated last month from National Right to Life Committee, says, Mr. Smeagol's charge, and I'm going to quote it, is utterly false. You all can go to House.gov. There's no secret vote site in Washington. You go to House.gov. You can see what's in these bills. That Cromnibus bill had three new pro-life provision, provisions in it. It also had, it had, oh my gosh, this is like an entire budget bill. It has thousands of things to suggest that, that if you vote for this bill, you're voting for each and every isolated piece. Oh, is, you, all, you, all, you can figure out what that is. Let's talk about how to, get, how to get Congress right again. What you have to do is you have to pass redistricting reform. This is incredibly important. Now, I testified for the governor's redistricting bill right down the road in Easton, and part of my testimony was that redistricting bill will hurt me. Look, redistricting in the last district made this a more Republican district. It made it more easy for a Republican to win, but it's wrong. Redistricting needs to be done objectively, with attention paid 
to geographic and jurisdictional boundaries. It makes no sense to have parts of three Western Shore counties in this district when you can have one and, and make up the 705,000 people in the district. It makes no sense. What you do when you have redistricting like that is you polarize Congress. Because we spend our time running to the right of each other here. And in the other seven districts, they spend their time running to the left of each other. And what happens when you get down to Washington? All the moderates are gone. You, if you, I urge you, and the Democrats in the General Assembly oppose the governor's efforts at redistricting reform. I urge you, contact the General Assembly, tell them next year, I'm sure the governor's gonna put it in again next year, put it in until it's passed. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Jackson. Well, I think uh, one thing you're finding here today, uh, which leads to a lot of the arguments over here, is the Cromnibus, the Cromnibus bill. We need to have the bills stand on their own merit and own accord. When you start stockpiling all these bills into one big bill with one vote, that's why we have this problem. If we can have each bill independently done, I don't care how long it takes to get it done, you need to get it done. We need to act more timely on our bills if that's gonna be the case. But that is the common denominator here of what we need to do. That would be one major issue that I, agree, that I think should be done in, in D.C. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Mr. Goff. Well, for one, uh, how I bring Congress back together again is one of the first things I'd do is move the office back into the Cannon Building with all the other congressmen. And because you can't talk to other congressmen in the hallways, when they say reach across the aisle, they're literally right across the aisle. You got the Democrats on one side, you got the Republicans on the other side. So. I've been in that Cannon Buildings. I don't know if y'all have been in there, but uh, you know, it's everybody's fighting each other, and they're not talking to each other, and nothing's getting done. And I'm sorry, but this Congress has completely disconnected itself with us, the American people. They have health insurance, to, okay. Not like us. They forced Obamacare on us, but they don't have the same health insurance that we have. Okay? It's got to stop. Whatever we're forced to have, they should have. Congress is, is out there, man. They're just not connected with the American people. And I have tried my darndest to even meet with our congressmen in the past three, four years, and I've not been able to even get a meeting with him. So, you know, talk about disconnected. I, I, I'm a constituent. And, you know, you got to meet with your people. You got to listen. We're supposed to work for you, the American people. You're supposed to tell us what to do. You know, we look at the bills, review it, summarize it, tell you, and then you tell me how to vote. It's not I'm just going to vote and then just deal with it. You tell me how to vote on these bills. Thank you. Thank you. This next question is about climate change. First, do you accept that human behavior has contributed to climate change? And how do you distinguish yourself as the best qualified candidate to address the challenges of climate change? Mr. Harris. Thank you. Look, I think there's no question that uh, human behavior has contributed to climate change. The question is to what degree whether it's reversible practically, how fast to reverse it, and what economic impositions can be made as you're attempting to reverse, the, again, the human contribution. That's where everything lies. I mean, it lies in the question of, of all of, this is all modeling, this is scientific modeling. I mean, there are models out there, those of you who, who know the uh, famous hockey stick curve, for instance, uh, proposed over a decade ago, if you go back, this hockey stick curve that showed how uh, the temperature was supposed to increase with a, with a uh, uh, hockey stick inflection on it, has already been shown that it, that it's not, that wasn't a good model. Temperature in, for, we know temperature pause, the temperature increase pause, it'll probably continue again, but not according to the models that, that we have. So therefore, you say, okay, if we don't have a good model, what it, what's reasonable to do and what's not? Well, I think what, well, the first thing you got to do is you got to protect you got to protect American industries to the to the biggest extent you can. One of our industries is the coal industry. Now there are ways to burn coal cleaner without destroying the American coal industry, uh, without driving up the price of energy. How many of you have have a lower energy bill per kilowatt hour 
Nobody. It keeps going up because we've, we've actually kneecapped the, the least expensive, for a while it was least expensive, now natural gas maybe, uh, way to produce energy, which is coal in this country. So this, it's always a balance. We've got to balance it. And I think, I think this administration, honestly, is not, has not balanced it because the coal industry has been destroyed in the country. Our energy prices go up. And in the end, scientifically, we don't know if that economic investment is going to yield what we think it will because the modeling is, is just modeling. It's not scientific evidence. It's scientific models. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Jackson. Uh, I, I believe the, clearly with the population we got and all the industry we have in the world, we have affected the atmosphere a little bit, but to to the level that they say it is that we're destroying Earth and we're changing the entire um, temperature, raising the temperature throughout the world, I don't believe so. Uh, NOAA has actually dispelled that uh, recently, and um, I believe that we also have the uh, natural cycle of just temperatures fluctuating over the course of the history of Earth. Um, but one thing we need to do is we need to have EPA involved with our industry so that we can monitor what they're doing and, and making sure that we're doing the right stuff here in the U.S. But more importantly, I think we need to, uh, as a whole, as a humanitarians and as business industry, work with our um, allied countries and fellow countries out there to make sure that they're doing the right thing, like China. I mean, we just watched the Olympics a few years ago and they, you literally couldn't watch what was going on on TV because the, the smog in, in was so thick and so bad in those countries that individuals are actually wearing you know, face masks and stuff like that. All that, just from the Earth cycle and wind and everything else, it's all going to find its way around the world and eventually over to this country. So we need to continue to do the right stuff and monitor what we're doing. But again, we need to reach out to the other countries and ensure they're doing their part also. Thank you. Mr. Goff. I gotta agree with that, but uh, I mean the common sense is um, China, we, they can't be controlled. We can't tell China what to do. <clears throat> India, we can't tell India what to do. And as far as America, uh, we use aerosols that destroy our ozone layers. Uh, we have hot spots, you know, around our oceans that create uh, tsunamis and, and 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 all these other, you know, atmospheric problems that we have but the thing is you know the common sense thing to do is we can't tell these com countries what to do how to act but when we deal with them in business we can persuade them okay to start cleaning up their act and the other thing is i wanted to talk about is fracking you know what are we what are we doing to our well waters uh what are we doing to our our, our own united states of america uh, I, I think that uh, the government's too hard on the coal industry. I think they're putting all those coal miners out of work. And, I mean, there's, there's moderation. Our government always does things too far to the left or too far to the right. There's no moderation. And they gotta have, they got to be a little bit more moderate when they're dealing with these big corporations as, as far as, you know, how they're, uh, they're doing business, you know, and what they're doing to our waterways and our well waters you know, and pollutants. So, you know, we, we can, we, we, can, we have things to do and, and there are important things that we can work with, but we, like I said, moderation. Just don't go too far to the left or to the right. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Smeagol. I think this is a case of everything's been said, but uh, not everybody said it. Um, unfortunately, I find myself in the inevitable position of uh, agreeing with Congressman Harris. Um, <laughs> I think he read my notes. I'm, I'm just Write kidding. Write that down. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I, I, I do agree with uh, many of the things Congress Harris said uh, with my position on that, so I won't take up all your time. Thank you. Okay, the next question. We begin with Mr. Jackson. Who do you support as the presidential nominee for your party and why? Uh, I support Donald Trump. And the reason I support him, again, he is an individual that uh, is an outsider. Uh, he's run his uh, campaign um, just like me. I'm not someone that's from D.C. Uh, I'm a grassroots campaign. Obviously, I don't have the billions of dollars he has to fund my own campaign. But again, I don't have no special interest groups supporting me. I don't have lobbyists supporting me. Um, you have an individual that uh, is trying to run on his own accord and 
And I think it's actually um, admirable that he has both parties despising him in some ways because he can't be bought and paid for. So he's going to go in and hopefully do the right things. And that's why I support him. Thank you. Mr. Goff. Donald Trump, uh, and I have looked into his, his issues. I mean, I'm listening to the issues, and the issues make sense. And I'm looking at uh, the, t the trade issues, the border. We do need a wall. It's out of control. Everything he's saying does make sense. I mean, we're talking the Iranian deal was the worst deal that you can ever imagine. How can Congress let this, this Iranian deal even pass? I mean, 70 percent of Americans didn't want that Iranian deal, and it passed anyway. You know, where's the fight? You know, I, I just don't see the fight in Washington, you know, when things like this happen. But, uh, you know, listen to, you know, I think that, he, that Donald Trump is getting a bad rap, and I think that, I think he's the best man for the job, and he's not being controlled, and that's what scares me about Washington. A lot of these guys, are get, they're getting PAC money, and and they're controlled by these lobbyists. Thank you. Mr. Smigo. Uh, I was a Rand Paul supporter. I was a Ron Paul delegate to the 2012 con uh, uh, in Tampa, and I am one to be a delegate as well as uh, uh, on the ballot to be a congressional uh, candidate this term. And I don't have a name next to me right now. And what I wrote to the League of Women Voters uh, when they asked, what you want to put out there is I said, as the parliamentarian in the Maryland House of Delegates and as an attorney who three times uh, brought suits against Martin O'Malley while he was governor uh, for things that he did that I consider to be extra constitutional, I want to make sure that the candidates who are in the race now, both Mr. Trump and Mr. Cruz, do not have the election stolen by the establishment Republicans who go down there and decide they're going to do something different. So I'm going down to make sure whoever gets it, gets it pursuant to what the rules are and the regulations. And I'll support whoever gets the nomination. Um, like I said, my person is out of the race, but I'm going to make sure that the party, um, we put principle ahead of party or politics, and that we make sure that the American people and everybody who participated and worked on behalf of these candidates, one of those candidates is the one who's the nominee of the party. Thank you. Mr. Harris. Hi, right, thank you. Uh, some of you may know I endorsed Ben Carson for president, campaigned with him. I've known Ben for 33 years. Uh, when he was a senior neurosurgery resident at Hopkins, I was a junior anesthesia resident and worked with him in the operating room and worked with him in the operating room subsequently while I was at Hopkins. <clears throat> ben Carson, in my mind, undoubtedly was one of the smartest people up on that stage. You remember that was a pretty big stage. Uh, he is an outsider, there's no question about it. I think that's one of the reasons why, why his uh, presidential campaign didn't work. He was probably too much of an outsider. He probably was too politically incorrect. Uh, he was just a nice guy. I mean, th he, he was one of the guys that, that nothing nasty ever came out of him because nastiness doesn't belong in a political campaign. We, we, in the political campaign is about thoughts and ideas and about the quality of the person you're voting for. And when I looked at it, I thought that Ben Carson was the choice. So I have to tell you, his name's going to be on the Maryland ballot. I think I'm going to fill in the circle next to Ben Carson. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I'm going to, we're getting uh, late in time, so I'm going to combine these questions. Um, but they really relate to the same position. So what is your position on a living wage for all workers, wage equality for women, and raising the minimum wage? And would you sponsor and support legislation that required equal pay for women? And I believe we're starting with Mr. Goff. Of course I support the equal pay for women. My wife's a biomedical engineer. My, my daughter's a, a, a paramedic for Baltimore County. And uh, I was a single dad growing, you know, for 13 years. And I had nothing but girls. I raised nothing but girls. So I, I was the Mr. Mom, you know. But uh, of course, I, I, I support the equal pay for, for women. And, uh, and, and, and in fact, um, I have a story, but I, I don't have enough time to tell this story. It's about a, a woman who was in Germany who actually invented the brake pad because she stopped at the shoe store. And uh, I mean, not the shoe store, the shoe repair. And, and, and she put a piece of leather on the block of wood that stopped her automotive engine. So she was really the, in essence, she was the person who who invented the brake pad, and she came from the Mercedes family. So 
Yeah, I, I, I support the equal pay for women. Thank you. Mr. Schmeagel. Um, no to the living wage, it hurts. Um, I don't understand. Um, you have to have a place for people to come in. When I was a young kid and I went in and I got a job, I started, I worked my way up the ladder. Um, the, there are many jobs that don't, uh, should not be the jobs that you take to raise your family one. Once you say you're going to be $15 an hour, then they've got to lay people off. It's not, you lay people off, people don't, uh, you have to raise the prices that you're charging and it becomes much harder to either have the minimum wage or to say yes, 100% to men and women should get, and I believe that is the law, they should be paid the exact same. Um, I don't think that that should be any consideration whatsoever. You get you get the same, you get the benefit of what you put in. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. Um, and yes, I would support any law that says that that, or a penalty for not doing it. Um, the minimum wage is a problem, as I said, because what happens is the businesses, if you got $100 to pay in salary, you don't get 150, somebody gets laid off. And so many of these jobs are not meant for people to be raising their families on. The problem is government is involved in this. Get government out of your life. There's nothing whatsoever in the Constitution that says that the government should be involved in making those decisions. Article 1, Section 8 lays out very specifically what the government should be doing. Nothing in there with regards to those wages. Thank you. Mr. Harris. Uh, I believe that the minimum wage and living wage should be left up to local jurisdictions and states. That's the bottom line. That's what this is. We have a federal government. It's, feder you know, it's, a, it's a collection of states. And if one state wants to, and look, we're going to have the experiment done. I mean, New York and California have raised the minimum wage to $15 an hour, the highest minimum wage across the country. And we're going to see what it does. Because there are conflicting, if you read the economic research on minimum wage, you get two conflicting stories. You get one is that it improves the, uh, the conditions for those who are, who, because minimum wage workers tend to be less educated uh, and younger. And you have conflicting uh, evidence, ec economic research evidence, that says that, in fact, you impair the ability of young, uneducated people to enter the job force and then go up through the scale. So we're going to have the experiment in the United States. We're going to actually have a couple of states that have a very high, by comparison, it's almost twice as high as the federal minimum wage. And we're going to see what happens, what happens in those states. That's a good idea, because we will answer for once and for all the question is, does a minimum wage hurt or help those who you, who you think you're targeting? With regards to equal pay, look, look, the delegate's right. The law's already on the books. We have the Equal Pay Act. We have the Lilly Ledbetter Act. The fact of the matter is, it's that the opportunity has not been the same. You know, the president's own West Wing office, when they calculated, the women got paid on average less than the men. But that's because the women didn't hold as high positions as the men, or for as long. So the answer is to give women e the equal opportunity to obtain those, those, those positions because the federal law already protects them. Once you get into that position, no one can discriminate uh, you on wages whether you're a man or a woman. So that's the answer, is make sure that we have other policies that, that allow women to get that opportunity to obtain those positions. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Jackson. Okay. When it comes to uh, uh, women and having equal pay, I'm, also, I'm all for it. Uh, my whole entire career has been involved in government jobs from the state police to the Marine Corps. Um, I even worked for a while at General Motors, uh, the General, uh, General Motors plant in uh, Browning Highway in Baltimore. All those jobs had preset pay. I mean, the, you, wherever your level was, whatever your rank was, was a set pay. So it didn't, it didn't matter whether you're female or male, that pay was set in stone. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm all for females having the exact same pay as a male, and, and it should be that way. Uh, it's just in the private industry, I've never had to deal with uh, that portion. But again, um, as the other uh, candidates were saying, I, I would definitely like to s see the females at the same pay as the male. Um, in regards to minimum wage, I think we have to be very careful with that. We're walking a very fine line between what would be the acceptable uh, minimum wage for, to allow people to raise families and stuff like that. Uh, but at the same time, if we make it too high, we're also going to shut down a lot of uh, small businesses because they can't afford to sustain that and pay uh, uh, $15 an hour to a, uh, for a small business to sustain that for their uh, uh, employees. Plus, off, like McDonald's, different industries like that, you're going to find that they might just go ahead and eliminate a lot of those positions and make them just standing kiosk machines, order what you want on a kiosk machine, and then it'll eliminate jobs. So you're almost shooting yourself in the foot. But the one biggest thing to me is this. you got a Marine private right now 
will make $9.41 an hour if he only works a 40-hour work week. Anybody that did time in the service knows, as a private, you will never work a 40-hour work week. You're probably averaging 60 to 80. So if you're going to pay a Marine who's going to be over the age 18, 19, 20, who's going to risk his life to defend this country for $9.41, I'm sorry, someone at McDonald's should not be making more than that Marine. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Or... We're getting close to the last question, and this is a, a difficult one. Do you support gun con control legislation? One, to restrict the purchase of guns by people on the no-fly terror list, and two, by removing guns from those convicted of domestic abuse. Mr. Schmiegel. People on the no-fly list uh, have consisted of Teddy Kennedy, children five years old. There is absolutely no due process. There is no constitutional method of determining who goes on. It's done by somebody in a back room in a secret way. Absolutely not. No, you don't take away constitutional rights from anyone. I'm 100% supportive of the Second Amendment and every constitutional right. I fought for your Fourth Amendment, your Tenth Amendment, your First Amendment, and I'll fight for your Second Amendment rights. Absolutely not. There's no way you should be taking away these rights from anybody. If a person's engaged in domestic violence, then yes, they can lose the rights to have. Uh, the interesting thing is if the husband or the wife use an instrument such as a bat or a knife, they don't take the bat or the knife, they come and take the gun. Um, so I think that yes, you should not, if you have a propensity toward violence already in Maryland, you can lose that right. And we already have laws that say if you're involved in any domestic violence, they take away the firearm. And one of the interesting things is when the bill came up in Maryland, the, st uh, sorry, the state police came in uh, and actually wanted to say, um, wait, you have to uh, exclude state police officers from this if they were in domestic violence because we'll lose too many state police officers or police officers. And we said, wait a minute, you know, you're not going. And so they actually backed down when we stood up on the floor and said, no. Anybody engaged in the domestic violence should not have access to the firearm, and we were able to do that. So I do say there are th ways that you lose that right, but I'm a plus from the NRA. Um, I'm the leading Second Amendment supporter uh, in this state for the last 12 years, and I will continue to fight for the Second Amendment rights of everybody. Thank you. Mr. Harris. Thank you. Look, my, my position on Second Amendment rights is clear. I mean, I'm A-rated by the NRA. I'm endorsed by the NRA. And I, 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 don't, I don't say that in any way that, except that I, I'm proud of it in a way that, again, my parents came from communist countries where you didn't have the right to own a gun. And it was because the government was afraid of, afraid of citizens having, having a gun. So I do believe that the Heller decision got it right, that, the, that, that owning a firearm is an individual right in this country, and it can only be removed by the government under very specific circumstances, each of which has to involve due process. Now here's the reason why I voted against uh, saying that, you know, someone on, on the government's quote, no-fly list uh, should, not, should not be restricted from owning a handgun because they won't show you the no-fly list. In fact, there are several lists that are, that are terrorist lists, only one of which is the no-fly list. And the way the legislation was worded, it was obscure as to which list it is. I don't know, because they're, they're talking about it in the state here. I don't know how they're going to define it. There were close to a million people on the terrorist watch list, but there were only 80,000 or 90,000 on the no-fly list. But you, you don't know if you're put on. The government doesn't notify you. And they don't make it clear how you get taken off. I mean, that's how Teddy Kennedy got on the no-fly list. It's the bottom line. You can't do that. You can't take someone's right away without due process. Now, if they create a due process method, that would be all right. But they can't because the, they want to keep the no-fly list fairly secret because, of some, because they're investigating people on the no-fly list. So, you know, this is a balance. This is a balance of rights versus you know, uh, with terrorist control, and I think we have to come down on the fact that due process is very, very, very important in this country. It's what separates us from totalitarian countries is due process. You read about this all the time. People in China and Russia, they get hauled off to jail, no trial, no due process. Can't do it here in the United States. That's what separates us. Thank you. Mr. Jackson. Okay. In regards to the no-fly uh, no zone or no-fly list, um, I, I don't agree with it. Um, 
individuals, again, uh, as Mr. Smeagol was talking about, we have due process. When it comes to uh, certain things like propensity of violence and domestic abuse, we do, the Maryland State Police does take guns away from those individuals in a temporary process until they've had their time in court and, and they've had the, the case adjudicated to make a determination to take their right away from them if they've shown that they cannot uh, be an individual to be trusted to have a firearm in their possession. So I agree with that. Um, I am a big Second Amendment rights uh, individual. Uh, again, I don't have the, the backing of the NRA or any of them, but I can tell you right now that I believe that that is your uh, right to have a firearm. Um, our forefathers back in the 1600s, uh, they were extremely concerned back in those days of England and the king's rights and the taking away of the firearms from the individuals and the citizens. And again, you can see that almost to the, in today. It's almost correlation that you got a tyrannical government that's attempting to disarm us to keep us down and keep us uh, unable to defend ourselves. So don't wait at home for someone to show up, law enforcement or the military to protect you. Oftentimes you're gonna to to take matters in your own hand first and then have the backup show up later on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Goff. Well, what's the Constitution say? That the government cannot infringe upon our right to own a gun. And it should not, we should not have any government telling us we cannot own a gun. Let me tell you what's going over on right now in Ukraine. The government took their guns away from them. And now they can't even protect themselves from Russia. We are the biggest army in the world, the American people. But yet the government doesn't want us to know that. We are the biggest army. And I am a very big Second Amendment person. It says infringe upon. And that, to me, I don't even think that we should be paying licensing fees for our guns. Because that's an infringement. And that's how I feel about the Second Amendment. And it's going to stay that way if I'm the Congress. Thank you. And I think we're at last question here. And um, it's comment, please comment on the military budget. I'm starting Mr. Harris, I think. Thank you. Uh, you know, I'm kind of glad we finally got around to foreign policy because I think this is something that uh, we live in a very dangerous world. Let me put it that way. This is a very, very dangerous world. And, it's, and it has become more dangerous, not less dangerous, over the last decade. And I don't care whether you, you're talking about Russia, Eastern Europe, the Baltics, the Middle East, whether you're looking at ISIS controlling from Tunisia to Pakistan, whether you're looking at Iran uh, obtaining nuclear, they're going to obtain a nuclear weapon. And they're, they're just thumbing their nose at us in terms of uh, developing ballistic missiles that can deliver it. You know, the Asia pivot. You know, we were supposed to have this reset with China and Russia. And China is in, in uh, building islands in the South China Sea. They're, they're invading islands in the East China Sea. You look all around the world, it is a dangerous place. So our military, like it or not, the United States is viewed as the leader of the free world. And some people like it, some people don't. Isolationists don't. Neoconservatives, or whatever you want to call them, neocons, they like it. Whether we end up somewhere in the middle, we default to the people who, we are the nation that controls the peace in the world. And this has been true since World War II. It's the bottom line. We're very different from everyone else who control, who had a, a powerful military, and that we're the only military that actually goes, wins a war, and then turns the country back over to the people and helps them rebuild. Everyone else occupies the country. Whether you look at Russia, whether you look at China, whether you look at what North Korea wants to do. I didn't mention North Korea. North Korea, 200 nuclear weapons with an ICBM device that can hit the continental United States. You can't allow it to happen. So two things you need in the military budget. First thing you need to do is make sure that our, that our nuclear arsenal is modernized, that we have an anti-ballistic missile defense, that we can defend against incoming missiles from rogue nations like North Korea and Iran. And the third thing you do is restore our, our military capability. We need 15 carrier groups in the Navy, not 11. The President proposed to bring it down to nine. We can't do it. Our military is overstressed. They're over, we, we, it's gonna be hard. They're overstretched. It's hard to get people to come into the military. We need to restore the military power to keep the peace, not to go to war. Because the U.S. doesn't have military to go to war. It has the military to keep the peace. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Jackson. Okay. Um, basically, uh, Andy has said a lot of good stuff in regards to uh, having a strong army. Um, right now, our government pays 18% 
towards our national defense. 18 cents for every dollar that is brought in is put towards uh, national defense, where 20 percent, 20 cents of every dollar is, is, is uh, basically put towards welfare. We need, to, we need to build up a stronger military, but what we need to do is have the best of equipment for them, but we also need to increase their pay, which would encourage a lot more people to join the military so we do have a strong, uh, strong military force. By having a strong military force, we will be a strong leader within the world. But with the leadership, that's the huge part with our government per personnel that we can't just keep selling ourselves out and selling themselves out to different deals with the Iran, uh, Iran deal, the nuclear deal. And it, so we need to have a, a stronger setting and have personnel in place with some conviction and be able to stand behind the uh, what we stand for. And to, so when we say that we're going to invade or we need to have you stand down on one of your actions, we will take the necessary appropriate force to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Goff. Of course we need a strong military. I think we're pretty bad as it is right now. But, uh, and why hasn't other countries invaded America in all these years? Because they're afraid of us. And we need to keep them afraid of us. We need a strong military. But then on the other hand, think about this. This, this is what I did. I called John McCain's office. And then I called the Senate Arms Committee. And I wanted, to, I wanted to know one question. Why can we shut down a pickup truck or a car in our backyards, but we can't shut down a $10 million tank when it falls into the wrong hands? Where's the common sense? Now, you know, spending in our defense has got to have common sense. And right now, the way some of these defense contractors are just spending the money, it's... Some of these stories that I'm hearing, it's ridiculous. But you just need common sense, and you need to spend it wisely. But we, we do need to modernize. Because, believe me, China and Russia, they got their eyes on us, and so does North Korea. So we, we got to make sure we keep them in check. I had two colonels in my family. My, I have pilots in my family. My whole family was military. Believe me, I know more about the military than most of these guys up here. Okay? And I've heard all the stories. I got a sword at home from the surrender. My great uncle was at the surrender standing next to General MacArthur when Japan surrendered to America. He was in Pearl Harbor when it was bombed. And that's what I had to hear my whole life, how bad the Japanese were from my great aunt. So, yes, we do need to spend money on our military, but we got to spend it wisely. Thanks. Mr. Spiegel. Thank you. I think three of us up here are veterans, and we'll tell you that the number one thing that we need to make sure is that if we're ever in a position that we have to send our sons and daughters into harm's way, we want to make sure that they have the very best of equipment and technology that's available anywhere in the world that we make sure that we honor their service by not abandoning them when they're on the battlefield or when they come home. And to make sure that they have the ability to get the medical care that they need and they are not stuck in some system that leaves them waiting to get to see a doctor until they either die from the wounds that they have or they uh, take their own life, which is happening all too often. So. I do think that we have to modernize our military to make sure that America projects the image of strength. We do not have to be the policemen of the world, but we do need to let others know that there are repercussions and that we can back those, rep those uh, words up if we have to say we've drawn a line in the sand and, and make it mean something. Right now, our Navy is in atrocious shape. We need hundreds of ships. As the Congressman had said, um, we need to rebuild the Navy. We need to uh, add additional forces to our Air Force, and we need to make sure that we modernize and have the technology out there and available to make sure that our men and women are as safe as any way they could possibly be if we're going to send them into harm's way. So, Thank you. It also helps with the economy, um, you know, to be building and have the, put them back to work. And that's something that we can do is to uh, give 
those arms to our allies overseas who are our allies um, who need them, and that helps. Thank you. Thank you. We've reached that point um, for closing arguments, or the closing statements, excuse me. <laughs> Let's see. Everybody gets their choice. And we're, uh, we're going to start with Mr. Goff and go in the opposite direction from the opening statements. So, Mr. Goff. Okay, we all know that Congress is has not done their job for us, the American people. And to me, a politician is like a dirty diaper. You need to change it for the same reason from now on again. Now, the thing is, you know, I'm as mad as everybody else is in this room with this government. We got open borders. We got to secure our borders. Why can't we put our military on the borders? How many agencies do we have? My goodness gracious, we got 20 some different agencies Homeland Security, FBI. Name all these agencies we have. Utilize them. In fact, make them do their job. Wouldn't that be nice? It's about time that our government starts working because ever since Obama's got in office, it seemed like they all just like stopped working. It's like we don't have a government anymore. So I don't know about y'all, but this is how I feel. And we need to start getting them back to work. ICE, do your job. We have Americans getting killed by illegal immigrants coming across the borders. We have ISIS within these Syrian refugees. I don't want to see ISIS in, inside the United States. I don't want to see a, a mess in this country. So if you want somebody to fight for us, here I am. I'm, from, I'm the only guy on the stage that's never collected a check from the government. Okay? I'm from the people. We the people. That's who I'm from. Okay? So I, I'm here to represent you guys, and, I, and you, I'm supposed to work for you. You tell me how to vote. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Jackson. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you again for everybody for coming out and uh, taking, uh, taking some time with us this afternoon. Um, again, I'm served for the Marine Corps, served with the state police. I've been 25 years of public service. Uh, I want to continue with my public service now that I'm uh, near the end of my time with, uh, with the Maryland State Police, and I look forward to serving with you. Um, I don't pretend to know everything. I don't. But together, everybody here, we could work together. And, and I want to have that customer service for you where you will have direct contact with me so that you can vent your frustrations, tell me your concerns, or bring your expertise to the table that I, I would love to apply to my decision making it, because it's not just my seat, it would be our seat. So if you, you know, April 26 comes up, if you vote for me, you can help me and I'll help you. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Thank you. And again, I want to thank the League of Women Voters for doing this, something that, again, you can't do in a lot of countries around the world. We should, we should get up every morning and appreciate that. You know, it'll sound sappy, but when I looked into my new grandson's eyes last night, I thought what a lot of you probably think. All we want in this life is a better world for our children and grandchildren. That's all. We want to be better than the one we had. And that's what your congressman better go to Washington and be thinking about every single day. Is it a better world? Is, is are my children and grandchildren going to be going to a safe school where they can learn something? Where they actually learn competitively and they learn as much as anybody else in the, in the rest of the world and not to be outdone by, by a child who's learning in Japan or in China or somewhere else? When they grow up, is, is college going to be affordable for them? You go look at what colleges uh, cost. It's unbelievable. We've got to keep college affordable because we have to keep our workforce a 20th first century workforce, and that's an educated workforce. We've got to do it. We've got to make sure the college is affordable and it prepares people for jobs. We have to make sure that our economy grows. And we can't be happy with 2% GDP growth. We can't be happy with that. Historically, we should be at 4%. We're growing half as much. We can't maintain two things. One is we can't maintain the standard of living, which we'd all like to have, again, for our children and grandchildren. And the other thing is we can't pay off our federal debt if we, if we don't have growth. So we have, to, we have to focus in and make sure that we have op job opportunities and economic opportunities for our children. Finally, we need a safe world. The bottom line is how many of you, when, when we heard about what went on in Brussels, thought, oh my God, it could happen here? and that my children and grandchildren are going to live in a very, very different world than I live in. 
If we don't control terrorism, we have to control terrorism. We have to do it. This is a war. We should declare war on ISIS, and we should fight them, and we should win that war. Look, my record is an open book. I've been, it's been a privilege to serve the 1st Congressional District. I've taken over 3,600 votes. You go to house.gov, you can see every single one of them. I'm going to ask for your vote, and I'm going to ask you to, to send me back to Washington to take care of our children and grandchildren. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Schmeagel. Thank you. Thank you to League of Women Voters. Go to SchmeagleforCongress.com, and I'll show you all the votes that he don't want you to look at. Um, principle over party, principle over politics. That's what you want is somebody who's going to go down and maintain their principle. I got more things passed in the Maryland legislature by reaching across party lines, working with Heather Mazur, working with Lou Simmons, working with others across party lines, maintaining principle, but being able to get things done. That's what you do. You don't go down and say, I'm going to do one thing. You don't say, I'm going to not vote for Obamacare and I'm going to fight it, but then actually vote for it. You don't say that with illegal amnesty and expanded federal funding on abortion. And then when you come here, say, well, look, it was all in this big bill and there was a whole bunch of other things in there and you had to pass those other things, so it's okay that I did all these things that I told you I'd never do. That's not what you want from somebody in Congress. You want somebody who will do what they tell you. And I've done, and I've done over 20,000 votes, 20,000 votes, and you can look at those and see that I will do exactly as I told you. As far as, uh, yes, college is expensive. I've got two children in college. My son is a graduate student at Johns Hopkins. Micah currently making movies. My daughter is at uh, Point Park University, um, and she's going to be a dancer. I got children also that I want to grow up uh, and, and to have a place that they can get a job, and that's why I'm doing this, because I want to make this a better world also. And I want to make sure that when I tell you, or the person who's representing me in the first district goes to Congress, and they look out and they tell me something, that I know that I'm getting the truth from them, and that they're not going to get some song and dance about what you didn't look at and what you couldn't find, because you're going to be able to reach me on my cell phone, which I've given out for the whole 12 years I've been in the legislature, which is 410-920-0128. You'll never have a reason to say you couldn't reach your congressman, because I'm available 24-7, and I'm not changing that phone when I go to Congress. Thank you very much. Thank you. I want to thank the candidates end uh, for coming and, and sharing their views on all these questions. And I want to thank the audience for being here too. So let's give them a big round of applause.